Hello and welcome back. I'm Carol Jensen. A little more than a week ago, this riverfront was lined with volunteers, everybody pitching in in an effort to help minimize the damage from the great flood of 1996. And their efforts did not go unnoticed. I hope you will never forget this wall behind me. And goodness knows, I hope you never need it again. But I hope you will always remember for as long as you live what the people of Portland did in one remarkable day. And I hope that all of us will find in our minds and hearts the wisdom and strength to be a little more like the people of Portland were on that one day, every day of the year. It rather it touches your heart when you see the number of people down here that are helping out. Uh, they're either hammering, shoveling, digging ditches, or feeding the people who are working. It's very impressive. And I know the people from the city that I've talked to have been just as touched in their heart and just as impressed with the effort down here. People helping people. How often we say it, rarely, however, do we get a chance to see it in action. <laughs> I've lived here almost all my life, and I've not seen this. And I thought it was going to happen to somebody else. Today, much of the town of Woodland came together filling sandbags. This is tiring work to be sure, but for most, the decision to be here was an easy one. I'm from Vancouver. This is where the, this is where the problem was today, so I, we thought we'd come up and help for a while. Everybody's pitching in. Our houses are out there in the bottoms where it's going to go. And if that goes, then town might go. The rest of town, anyway. Some, however, had their decision made for them. Well, I had the day off, and my wife told me to get off the couch and come help. <laughs> Are you doing a good job? Good, got a boy. Not sure why I was bothering him. His mood swung when he realized he'd soon be a TV star. Many of these residents never imagined they'd see what awaited them early this morning. Certainly everyone impacted here along the swollen Lewis River, but probably the best illustration we have, the Rainey's house here. Down below they have roller skates and gym shoes, but if you look at the floor level, that's what their party room looks like. To the left of that, a three-car garage completely submerged. I'm happy to tell you those folks did have insurance for their home and their VW bus. And not to be forgotten in all of this, the animals, who were kind enough to give these people a lift. What friendly dogs. The relief efforts down here, the sandbagging just keeps on continuing. You can see folks down here. And they've said, like they've said, they've had volunteers just come in off the boardwalk here just wanting to offer to help, and they've pitched right in. And so this is the kind of spirit that we're seeing all over Portland, folks just lending a hand for their neighbors in need. This is only the beginning of the big show. The river is expected to rise another four feet by tomorrow morning. As you just mentioned, volunteers from Portland have been diverted over here to Vancouver. In fact, these are the volunteers you see behind me here, and they're working to build a big wall of sandbags here to protect the city of Vancouver. They've been working all night long, and they have built a very impressive wall, I must say. Over across the river, over across the Columbia River on Hayden Island, it's somewhat of a different story. Most of the preparations have already been made, and now what people have to do is just wait to see how bad it'll be. Late Friday, they sandbagged along Lake Oswego Canal. Several hours later, the work continues into the night. Volunteers have built a four-foot wall to hold back canal water at the Chilberg home on Keylock Road. But they know the odds are long. Well, the water still keep coming. We got a pump inside in the basement. And the one out here. And the water keeps rising. All day long, friends and strangers have carried sandbags here and at an untold number of homes around this area. We have a lot to be thankful for, even though, you know, we're probably going to lose a few things in our house. But, um, you know, the friendship and the support of people is more important than anything else. Not far away on Pioneer Court, a string of volunteers haul sandbags to save the home of Kim Gruder's ex-husband, who's out of town. She's amazed at the change in the little canal that now fills the bottom of this home. It's, it's just, it's indescribable. The smell, the way it looks, the destruction, the sound of it, the sound is, is so frightening. Despite the best efforts of a lot of sandbaggers, it's not always effective. Take a look at what's going on at this house. The water is coming right up to the door right up to the, the middle of the bottom half of the door. And we'll sh pan over and show you what's going on in the living room. You can see the water right through the front window here. 
And this is a house that's built on a hill beside the canal leading into Lake Oswego. Further up the canal at the first bridge, this is Bryant Street. The surging waters are expected to cover the bridge by midnight. At the last bridge before Lake Oswego, the National Guard passes through with another load of sand. And below the bridge, a glimpse of destruction, a boat and dock pinned against the bridge by the churning waters. Right down here, we have city crews that are blocking off access to Front Avenue because, of course, that's where the most concentrated relief efforts are going on, the sandbagging and barricading, getting the barricades up down at the seawall. And right now, you can see some of the sandbag action that we have here. Now, these are heavy things, and they will most likely keep some water out. How much is anyone's guess right now? Joining me is Todd Sparks with Hutan Gallery. Can you tell me, are you pretty confident of your precautions here? Yeah, we've done everything we can do. We put the sandbags around the perimeter of the building. Um, put all the furniture as high up as we can. We took everything out of our basement that uh, we could, and uh, we're hoping for the best. And, uh, a crane had him down in a harness, and he's trying to cut loose uh, that barge that holds the, uh, the Sternwitter Portland there as a kind of a loading dock. Uh, he was just hanging there using the hydraulic equipment trying to loosen that, uh, that barge up, and eventually they did, and they moved it away from the seawall. Uh, we're also going to show you some people that are still sandbagging down here and, uh, and they're working real hard and actually they had a few smiles on their faces as they were doing it. This is down near the Burnside Bridge uh, and they are uh, getting more sandbags up to kind of a different structure that we haven't seen before, a higher structure that was built down there to kind of hold the water back. Uh, and we do know that uh, I told you before about that drain that is basically overflowing now. That's a drain down there near the Burnside Bridge where water goes in and it basically drains into the Willamette River. Unfortunately, now uh, the river is, is, is much higher and that water is coming back up and they put some sandbags around that to try to keep that from getting any higher. That's basically the only place where the river is actually coming into Waterfront Park right now. We're going to show you that uh, gauge now on the Morrison Bridge. It shows you how high things are. Uh, it's above the six now. It's above 26 feet. This hay is heading for a herd in trouble. This Chinook CH-47 is here to help. Okay, that's good. The problem, the Columbia rose so high so fast, now there's no way to truck in hay to Pete Giordano's stranded cows. I've been there since 1983, and this is the first time I've seen anything like this. Here, three, two, one, traffic, uh, one across, four miles northbound, proceed direct to Government Island. That's where the Army National Guard comes in. Where the hay can't go in on the ground, the E Company 168th Aviation from Pendleton will take it there by air. We have some cattle right ahead of us. Okay, here you go. Yeah, but okay, go well. First drop's too low. They move higher to help split apart the bales and spread the hay. Okay, I see the cattle. They're over at that too. Let's go. The drilling is a big rush, and, and helping out the community is the number one thing, you know. Seen from the air, Giordano's herd seems better off than he thought, and now healthier thanks to the Army Guard. Yeah, they've been very helpful, and uh, they're really saving our lives. We're getting good at the disaster. We just transferred up from California, so we've done the floods, fires, riots, earthquakes. We're getting good at this stuff. What if I can't? What if they're all too heavy for me? You got that one all right? Yep. We realized that we were going to get water it was coming up through the ground and coming in the walls, and we went, holy cow. So and currently, we have sandbags on both sides of this wall. So these are the girls from Vancouver volunteering to come and, and help us get rid of them. One more in here, and then I'm ready to rock and roll here. Words can't express how grateful I am. It's great. It makes you feel good about yourself. I'm a pure helper at Mountain View, too, and I like to help people. And that's kind of the way I can do it. I, the flood didn't really affect my house in Vancouver, so, you know, I still wanted to help other people that are affected, so this is the way I could do it. It makes me feel good about myself. It makes me feel good that everybody is willing to help one another and not be real selfish. And we all understand that we all need each other's help. And I'm glad that the communities decided to help each other out. Oh, they're angels. They're just angels from God. The spirit of volunteering did not stop with the floods. Many that helped to keep the waters out also showed up to help the victims of the flooding. Jim Benneman will show us that when we continue. We'll return to the Great Flood of 96 
right after this.